presence. Uh, we've been having an increasing number of folks that have been joining us uh, on the internet for our class in Ezekiel. I have had uh, several requests uh, for me to mail workbooks to them and that sort of thing so that they can keep up with our studies. And so certainly we uh, appreciate that and welcome them uh, to joining into this study. Uh, tonight I wanted to look at the last couple of questions from uh, uh, lesson four, we didn't have quite enough time to uh, deal with those the last time that we were together, and I wanted to hit those before we moved into lesson number five for tonight. One of the things that we've been talking about is how God did some rather bizarre things with these prophets to gain the attention of the people. And as we look at some of the things that has happened to, uh, uh, to Ezekiel, he's been put on bread and water. Uh, he has uh, had to sleep on one side and then the other for a prescribed number of days. He played kind of like a child's game in setting up, you know, the city of Jerusalem and the forces that would be coming up against it. God had him doing a lot of things that would be observable to the people where they are going to ask, why are you doing that? And that was going to give him the podium that he needed to begin to share with them the instruction given to them of God. Now in question 12, God tells him to do something that quite truthfully kind of freaks him out. It was something far and away more than what he was initially capable of doing. It says uh, in question 12, explain God's command to the prophet to cook his food over excrement. And what was the meaning of this symbolic act? Well, if we go over to the fourth chapter and going down to, to verse 12, he said, thou shalt eat it as barley cakes and uh, thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. In other words, he was initially saying, I want you to cook your bread over human feces. And that was a bit much for Ezekiel. Uh, he goes on to, to have a response uh, back to that. Uh, going down to verse 13, the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. And then said, said I, O oh Lord God, Behold, my soul hath not been polluted, for from my youth even up until now I have not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came there uh, abominable flesh into my mouth. And then said he unto me, Lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread therewith. And it's not uncommon even today for third world countries and, and very deprived areas to sometimes use what we would call dried up cow patties as fuel for fires. And that in essence is what happens here for Ezekiel. And that is what he is going to be using to fire up his cook stove, so to speak, in the fixing of food. The reason being that every, this was not to be appropriate in terms of practice of the Jews. And Ezekiel says, I've tried and I'm still trying to follow all the dietary prescriptions that God had given for the Jewish nation. But of course, with them being in captivity, they were going to be in many situations where they were going to be forced to have what would be defiled food, for they had no other choice. And in looking at this, it was part of the condemnation that God said was going to be upon his people that all of their rituals and the commands of God and the things that they may have been used to doing in the past, much of this is going to be ripped away from them temporarily. In, in uh, question 13, it says, what in chapter 5, God told him to shave off his hair and his beard. And what was the meaning of this? He was to shave his hair and his beard and divide it up into thirds. And one third of that was going to represent the people who were going to perish by pestilence and famine. Another third was going to represent those who were going to die by the sword in Jerusalem. And the other third was going to talk about those who were going to be scattered and wound up going uh, uh, to all different locations, some fleeing away from captivity, others being in the captivity. But nonetheless, they weren't home. And things were not going to be for them as they were accustomed to. And so then, and finally, in question 14, why did Ezekiel conceal 
part of the hair in his skirts. In other words, of that third that was going to be scattered, there was a few strands of that that he took and actually hid uh, in his clothing. And that was going to show that even of the third that winds up being dispersed, there would be a very few in comparison, a remnant that would be spared and protected. That there were not going to be many folks that were going to escape the, uh, the uh, pure vengeance of God for all of the iniquity of the Jewish people. Now, moving into to lesson five, there is a profound set of lessons conveyed here to the people through Ezekiel the prophet. Now, as we talk about the bizarre life that these prophets often were forced to, to live, you know, there were all kinds of things that happened not only to Ezekiel, but to others. If we go over to uh, Isaiah chapter 20, I think it is in verse 30, there was a, a verse 3, there was a passage there when God was giving, you know, uh, the explicit detail about the fact that the Egyptians, the nation that Israel kept wanting to build an alliance with, the Egyptians are going to save us and they'll keep us from, from being destroyed by either the Assyrians or the Babylonians or whatever, that we'll trust in Egypt instead of trusting in God. Well, by the time that Isaiah's life has come around to this particular point, uh, the Assyrian Empire is, is, uh, uh, had its day, and then eventually the Babylonian Empire is going to, to arise. And as a way of showing the fate of the Egyptians, Isaiah is told that he is to walk naked and barefoot for three years. And he said, that's what's going to befall the Egyptians. Those people that you think are so great and so rich and so powerful, um, they're going to be led away captive by others as well. And so here again, these bizarre behaviors are going to be things that make everyone say, why? What's that mean? Now, what is the New Testament parallel to that? What New Testament prophet do we have that lived a little bit of a bizarre life. John the Baptist. In an age when cloth was common and they were able to make clothes, uh, you know, even for the poorest of the poor, you have John the Baptist who dressed how? All right, he was in goat's hair with a leather girdle and he ate bugs and wild honey. You know, and so his diet and his dress and other things about him, you know, locusts and wild honey was his diet. And, and so he even lived out in the wilderness. But people realized the uniqueness of his life, the role that he'd been given, the uniqueness of his message, and they came out to hear him. And so God accomplished a lot by these uh, different things that he laid upon these prophets. It would have made their lives very difficult, to put it mildly, but oftentimes you can stand and talk and stand and talk and stand and talk till you're blue in the face and people just tune you out. But whenever they begin to see the lessons demonstrated in life, it begins to arouse a curiosity. And if you can get that curiosity to be aroused, it often sets the stage for additional study and of being able to explain things from the Word of God. I don't know for a fact, but I would assume that, that quite often individuals observe the lifestyle of the Amish and the Mennonite, for example, and see the kind of different way that they live and it arouses a curiosity as to why. Why do you do that? Well, if you would approach a person of that persuasion and begin to talk to them about it, I'm sure they would be more than happy to use that as a launching pad to begin to explain their beliefs and their practices and why they do what they do. But individuals would be approaching them as opposed to them trying to, to, to round up other folks and say, don't you want to come live like me, you know? They have shown the interest, and now others can be teachers to folks who have a certain indication of, 
of curiosity and interest. And so we see that demonstrated uh, even in our day and time, that sometimes these outward actions are going to teach very profound lessons. Well, going now to lesson five and question one, the whole theme of this lesson is the fact that God is basically saying, I've had it. But I want you to understand why my glory is leaving the temple and why Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Because the easy thing was to walk away, kind of dragging your, your feet in the dirt and say, well, God's mad at us. I don't know why, but God's mad at us. He's forsaken us. You know, it's kind of God's fault. He's always been our protector. And, and now we've got all this mess to deal with. And, and I guess this is just our burden to bear until he decides to smile on us again. And they don't change. They don't realize their responsibility. They don't realize their rebellion and the punishment that they are receiving for their own iniquity. And so Ezekiel is going to continue to drive this lesson home because, you know, he's in some of the earlier groups that were taken away from Jerusalem. At this point, the city of Jerusalem still stands. The temple's still there. And so they have this misguided notion that yes, we've been punished, we are being punished, we've been carried away in captivity, but one day we're going to get to go home because God loves his people and we've always been the chosen people of God. And so yeah, we may have messed up a little, but God's going to let us go home as long as Jerusalem was standing. And so part of Ezekiel's job is to help them see just how rotten things had become. Here in question one, it says, describe the circumstances of this second vision that Ezekiel has and how much time had passed since the first vision. You know, he had this overwhelming vision of God. You know, seeing him as it were, on, as I would interpret the vision, trying to piece together all the imagery that's there. You've got the, the seraphim and the beast pulling, almost like a, a wagon, if, if you will, the throne upon that and all of the lights and, and all the power radiating from that, all of that in the earlier chapters when God first calls Ezekiel and says, I want you to be my spokesman to this rebellious people. Well, how long has it been now since he was called to do this? 14 months. Now remember, at the very beginning, he was so overwhelmed by everything that he was being told and everything that he was, was learning that basically his speech was taken away from him and he was you know, just pretty much kind of in a trance-like state some of the time because God had a lot of teaching and instruction to fortify Ezekiel for the work that he has to do. So now 14 months has passed, but who is he talking to as he starts relating his next vision? The elders of Judah. During this span of time since he was first, shall we say, anointed or called to be a prophet, there were some skeptics, there were some critics, there were some folks who didn't think Ezekiel was all of that much. But as they saw all those different imageries that we've been talking about, kind of the bizarre things that he did, the lessons he was sharing and what he was able to tell when God allowed him to, has now been able to bring an audience. And now the elders of Judah are here with him it's been 14 months since the last vision, and it appears by their showing some respect and coming to listen to him that they are now more accepting of the fact he is a prophet. This is somebody who is of God, and his message is worth our listening to. Here in the 8th chapter of, uh, of Ezekiel, in the first couple of verses, and it came to pass in the 6th year, in the 6th month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. And then I beheld in a lower likeness of the appearance of fire. And he begins to talk about this imagery that begins to, to show up before him. Now in the first part of this vision, 
that he is able to recognize much of the same imagery, the wheels, the, the, uh, the type of conveyance, the, the throne, the way that things had been when God had first revealed himself to him. And then the message tends to go a little bit further as to what all is happening. This image hits, and he begins to, to uh, looking here at verse 7, The morning is coming to thee, O thou that dwellest uh, uh, in the, the land. The time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountainside. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways and thy abominations that are in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord that uh, smiteth. Behold the day, behold it is come. The morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded, violence is risen up unto a rod of wickedness, none of them shall remain, nor of the multitude, nor of any of theirs, neither be there any wailing for them. And so now he begins to, you know, they're saying, wait a minute, we've already been carried off in captivity. But God's saying, I am not done yet. And so that's back in the seventh chapter where I was reading from, moving back over into to, to the eighth chapter where he picks up the things that, that happens in verse 3. He said, he put forth his hand and he took me by the lock of mine head and he lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me to the visions of God to Jerusalem. So, moving back now to where we saw the earlier promises of God, punishments coming, etc., etc. Now this next vision starts up here in chapter 8. We identify who it is that the hand of the Lord is upon him. And then he is transported in the spirit to Jerusalem. And where is he placed? All right, he is now at the north gate of the temple. That north gate was a significant spot. Because from the north gate is where you would go to the palace and to the homes of the royalty. And so all of the royalty would enter into the temple by way of the north gate as well as that's where the sacrifices would be brought that were going to be offered uh, unto God. It was sometimes referred to as the altar gate in Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 11. It was kind of a pretty much central area in the temple, and, and this is where this tour for Ezekiel now begins. But as we keep reading here as to what happens, it says in verse 5, Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes, now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy was in the entry. What would be that image of jealousy that would be in the entry in question 3? It was a wooden knot. If we go back over to what Manasseh did in 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 7, he actually dared to place an idol, an image, even in the temple of, of God. And so this is the first point of, of discussion for God. Look how blatantly they're ignoring my worship and what I want them to do, and they put this idol in there. And as we continue, as he talks about this, he furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abomination the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. He also makes the point here, that yes, they put an altar right here in the temple. But some of the glory of the God of Israel, he said, I've not gone off yet. I could have. I could have forsaken the people at this point, but I still stayed and tried to help. 
the glory of God still remained there. But as we're going to see in the unfolding of these chapters, it's now soon going to, to be taken away. He says, all right, now that's there at the north gate. But he continues on in verse 7. He says, he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, there was a hole of the wall. He said to me, son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said to me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. And what happens when he goes through that door? What's he see? All right, he goes into a room and here in secret, supposedly away from the main view of everybody else, there's all kinds of abominations going on in verse 10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. In other words, here they were making images, they were painting murals on the wall, it was all of these sort of celebratory things to honor idolatrous gods. And all of the tools that went along with that, the, the animals and things that were not considered, you know, they were unclean under Jewish law, but not by the idols. And so they see all of those things being here as well. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood, stood uh, J. Azaniah, the son of Saphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Who's kind of leading the parade here? Some of the leaders of the people. The sons of Saphan were secretly idol worshippers, and some of these would have been in positions of power even when Josiah was trying to clean house and get idolatry swept out of the land. But they were actually idol worshippers who seemed to think that God would not see all of the iniquity that they were into, which made them extremely corrupt leaders. They were very hypocritical. Maybe during the people, the time when the people would see them, they would appear so righteous and wanting to worship the great God of heaven and then go home to the idols that they built and to worship even, even them. And so these um, corrupt leaders were certainly not going to do much to help in, in cleaning house and getting people's hearts turned back to the, to the true and living God. But he goes on, in, uh, uh, as, so he winds up here in, in verses 13, go to verse 13, he said unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tamas. Now, in order to, to put together what was going on there, Tamaz was a Sumerian god, and she was the goddess of vegetation. And supposedly in the mythology of the Sumerians and many of the other civilizations along the Tigris and Euphrates River, she sacrificed herself and she became then the goddess of the underworld. And so there were rituals to her, one, you know, thinking about vegetation and life, there were many fertility rituals that went through her. And then on the other hand, there was the weeping and the mourning that she had died and left the, the and she was no longer Mother Nature in true form, but now she's the god of, uh, uh, of the underworld. And there were sympathies for her and worship to her. And as you see, you know, sometimes I think about the rough parallel today when you see those individuals who get all wound up about worshiping nature and loving the trees and the rocks and the water are special and sometimes elevate them even to almost a theology and a deity status in their eyes. And as Paul said in Romans 1, they worship the creature more than the creator. 
We worry more about cruelty to animals. And here again, that's a terrible thing when people are so insensitive. But we will make all kinds of fuss over that. But then all kinds of other iniquity can abound throughout the land and no one says thank you. And so the point that Ezekiel is being shown here is the various levels of corruptness that went up and down the line. That you have all of these people with various affections that weren't aimed toward God. But he's not done yet. As we go down to verse 16, he says, He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty and five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. So whenever we get down to question number six, he highlights that you have these 25 men as a representative number who had in essence turned their back on God. As far as doing what he had commanded, trying to serve him, that was no big deal. But what did they worship? The sun. Ray was the sun god of the Egyptians. That's one of the reasons why in the ten plagues, one of them was a plague of darkness, to show that God was greater than these false gods of the Egyptians. But the Egyptians were not the only ones who had a worship for the sun and a whole mythology about the sun being a chariot that goes across the sky every day and how powerful that sun is and how it gives life and, and, and so many other things. Here again, begin to look at the diversity of religious affections. You got some worshiping the sun. You got some worshiping uh, Tamas. You've got some that's worshiping the idol that's actually set up out in, in the, the main gateway. You have others who are worshiping a host of other idols and performing all kinds of iniquity in secret. This place was rotten to the core. It wasn't just, well, we're kind of not what we need to be, but if we fix just a few little things, we're we'll back on track. There was a wholesale house cleaning that needed to go on, and that's the point that God is making here to, to uh, Ezekiel. In question 7, it says, How do the executioners defend the glory of the Lord in chapter 9? As you move into the next chapter, there's somebody there, there's a, a group he calls to come forward, and they have weapons of war in their hand, and one guy has an inkwell. What's he supposed to do? All right, go out and make the mark. And it's going to separate the righteous from the wicked. And then these executioners are to go out, and all of those who were marked for death were to, to be killed. In, um, in verse 17, it says, Then he said, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? This is in the end of the 8th chapter. It is a like thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here. For they filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. In other words, they kind of thumb their nose at me. Any sort of despicable action they will do. And so he then calls in chapter 9, he says, uh, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, out of all of those that were called, how many showed up? Verse 2. How many showed up? Six. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen and with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the, bra the brazen altar. And the glory of God of Israel was come down from the cherub or upon his he was to the threshold of the house. Now we begin to see God beginning to make his exit. Instead of the glory of God filling the whole house, 
he's now gotten to the door. He is at the threshold of the door. And we find here in question eight, why do we find the, where do we find the first indication of the glory of the Lord moving away from his people and the city of Jerusalem? Summarize in a few words the, ver the vision of God's glory in chapter 10 and what new aspect is added to this chapter uh, to the earlier vision that he had in the first three chapters of God's throne and of his presence. Well, the glory of God is leaving. He's moving toward the door. The departure is gradual, but a consuming fire is now also introduced. Here in the 10th chapter and in verses uh, 6 and 7, it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with the linen, saying, Take fire from bet between the wheels, from between the cherubims. And he went in and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherub into the fire that was between the cherubims, took thereof, and put it into his hands, into the hand of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. There's going to be some destruction. There's going to be a mess. And God's vengeance is going to be visited. In question 9, it says, Who are the 25 men mentioned by Ezekiel? And what is their significance in the prophecy of chapter 11? He says in chapter 11 and verses 1 and 2 that these guys were what? What were they? All right. These were the leaders of the wickedness and the mischief. He said, Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house, which looked eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw, and he mentions here the sons of some of the prevalent Jewish families, and then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel to this city. And so here they are in wickedness. And whenever the prophet begins to relate his prophecy, one of these primary men did what? He fell over and died. And what's going to be the reality of this is that the news is eventually going to trickle back to the, to the exiles that that guy was alive in Jerusalem and on the day and time in which Ezekiel relates this, he fell over dead. Just as Ezekiel said that he would. And of course the guy makes the, the author makes the connection, how is that uh, uh, symbolic of the death of Ananias and Sapphira? Well, when their sin was made known, both of them died. And what was the effect on the church when Ananias and Sapphira died? They were afraid. Fear went everywhere. And so it is as people are going to recognize what uh, Ezekiel is doing here. And then he says in verse 12, we see where the glory of God goes. It leaves the temple. But what's the name of the mountain on the east side of the city to which the glory of the Lord resorted when his presence departed from the city? He goes to the Mount of Olives. What notable thing happened at the Mount of Olives in the New Testament setting? All right, Jesus was there frequently. Prayer was offered there. And it culminated with what? That's where the ascension back to heaven took place. As he left the Mount of Olives to go back to heaven. In question 13, what did the little sanctuary in 11, chapter 11 and verse 16 signify? that God was still going to remember the faithful people who served him, though they may be few in number and scattered throughout the world. God was not going to completely forsake his people. So he would continue to help those in some small measure, even after the great temple is gone and things continue to be destroyed in the city of Jerusalem. Any other questions or comments as we wind it up tonight? Okay, I appreciate your comments, appreciate your help with the, the answering of, uh, of those questions. Um, it gets kind of exciting to see the things that unfold here as Ezekiel is helping folks take a good hard look at themselves and to really drop their heads in shame to realize all the iniquity that they, they had sometimes going on right underneath their nose and they didn't pay any attention to it. We have the same challenge, maybe even in greater measure, 
in the day and time in which we live. As we try to talk to people about sinfulness and iniquity, how it abounds around us, and how it can so very easily affect us and our own lives. That's why throughout the scriptures, we are told to give diligence to make our calling and election sure. That we've got to just don't pretend everything's fine because I push a couple of good buttons and so that means, you know, I'm halfway to heaven already and all I have to do is die and I'm going to be there because I've done everything I need to do and everything is fine and yet there's a lot in our lives that we have attended to. We can be just like that scene in Ezekiel of where on the one hand You've got the priests of God that want to, to worship him and lead the worship of others and isn't this grand? And then they quietly slip back into the shadows and do what they want to do. Things that violate the law of God going and coming, but they do it anyway. That's why over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and going down to verse 5, Paul tells the Corinthians, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Christ Jesus is in you, except you be reprobates. You know, we have an obligation to live as Christians. To understand the things that he taught us, and to live according to those principles. First, he has said all, invited all men to come under him. And that involves our listening to what he said for us to do. To believe in him and to be baptized, Mark 16, 16. To be baptized for the remission or forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2, 38. Because baptism allows us to have that answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. So then we start the journey. Now, the Jews started that journey by birthright. If they had the right set of parents, they were Jews, they were in the family of God, and there were lots of blessings that were to go with that. But then look what happened. As they didn't appreciate who they were, they were, were not determined to do God's will. And we've been studying tonight all these illustrations of the way in which God was not first in their lives. Well, now we've been the beneficiaries of the crucifixion of Jesus. We're not taking animals to a temple someplace to have them sacrificed to try and atone for our sins. Christ was the perfect sacrifice. God's grace has been poured out upon man. We don't have to go through all of those actions to bring forth those kinds of fruits of repentance. But sometimes, I'm so afraid that what we do is we know that there's sin in our lives. Father, forgive me. And then we go right back to it again. And now I realize, sin is it's a hard, tedious process sometimes to be able to overcome iniquity in our lives. But we've got to fight the fight. Sometimes we don't. It's the idea of I just want to every now and then wash the board and make sure everything's clean because I'm going to start writing on it again with all of my other iniquities because I'm not examining and purging out the bad leaven. I'm not making changes in my life. Over in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul reminds us, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If Christ, if Christ truly lives in us, it's going to show by the lifestyle that we live, the choices that we make, and how diligently we try to serve. It's not a halfway kind of thing. It's not kind of like what was going on there at the temple, where... Sometimes I can get kind of righteous, but then over here I can also be like the whited sepulchers that Jesus called the Pharisees out as being. You're whited sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. 
And we can fall into that same trap of giving a certain appearance, but it not being genuine, not being from the heart. But just as Ezekiel learned, nothing was hidden from God. Those folks who were offering those sacrifices and serving those gods and painting those pictures on the wall seemingly thought they were doing it without God ever having any idea what was going on. But he did. And the Hebrew writer and other writers helped us to understand nothing passes God. So, we extend an invitation when we assemble together to give us all a chance to think about where we stand before God and if there's some steps we need to take to make our lives right in the sight of God. If there's some way we can help you, we urge you to come. Together we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain great is for you and me. Let us hasten.